der Wied, wo der Rebischer hat dann riesig liegen und hat dann gemacht, dass er so sein Dörr, was verrenzigt alle jeden von dem Dorf, wo das ist der Nossi hat dort, hat Nossi hu ha kein. Das Emme sorgt, dass der Nossi verrenzigt in sich, Hakel, alle jeden von klein bis groß, was Gott findet sich in sein Dorf. Was geheißen, verschreiben und notdrucken und befassen sein, verschiedene Takonis, wo befragt die Maimor in seine Detaille sein. Wo es in See Hotel gelebt und sich in See hereingelegt, wo so die alle Sachen und Herzen und Sachen und Rettwege in See und gelebt in See, versteckt das noch mehr. Wie baut der Sarebachai und gelebt mit seinen Tälen und mit seinen Takonis und mit seinen Schlichus und mit allen seinen Schlichus und das Gute im Magisch, als ob Hubachai im als er lebt zwischen uns und noch mehr in uns und lebt in Asami Neufen, bis wann und als er wird der Rieke und alle Ibereke in Jonim und Menschen werden seine Schluchen mit dem Schuss an der Welt Schluche Schlot und Gemäße. Friede Schone und Schone wird er noch mehr lebendiger und noch mehr starker und noch mehr aktiv zwischen uns und bei uns und durch uns bei jeder Rieden und in all, bei allen Rieden, bis in der ganzen Welt. Hi, welcome. I have to, okay, welcome. It's really, really um, an immense privilege. Um, an honor and somewhat petrifyingly humbling to be sitting together at this um, auspicious, intense Gimel Thomas, 28 years, to gather together to commemorate 28 years of the Stalkos of Al Rebbe. And I feel like after just that video clip, there's so much already to launch from. We're, we're, this is a culmination of four weeks of learning, a chana for Gimel Tamas, with um, Arv Chaim, beautiful letters we've been learning together. Um, and following this little Farbringen, which we hope everyone will get a little bit more involved in. It's an intimate crowd. Um, we will learn the fifth letter which is a wonderful bonus um, at the end. Um, and this is a project of Rechaim and Soul Words with Rabbi Shays Taub. So we're really, really, definitely, I know <laughs> they'll speak for themselves, but humbled and um, to be gathered at uh, this moment. Um, when we were approaching the discussions about, you know, the word histalkos, right? It's, it's an elevation. And for us as chassidim, gathering together all over the world, but gathering together here together by the aisle as well, we're just looking at the staggering estimation of 50,000 neshamas are gonna come to, to this between now and through this whole Shabbos and Sunday. And understanding what this means. And the truth is, I, I'm gonna be honest, we had, intense conversations throughout the week to really unpack the idea of 28 years and what that means to us on a very personal level and what that means to so many different people around the world. And you can't really, you can't take the time to not recognize and it, it really dawned on us and we'll all share together, this is a for bring in, but that every single one of us comes to this day with a certain common thread, a certain common bond, and yet all from very different vantage points. 
from a very different age ranges, different experiences. Those of us who, as Shani was sharing her experiences, I, I was a teenager, you were a mother, a an shlucha, adult. an adult. I, I thought I was an adult, I was just a teenager. <laughs> and Nechama, who's you know, younger in a different generation, born after Gimel Thomas, and in our, in our very, very deep and intense conversations throughout the week, we're gonna share and we're going to unpack it together because we realize the paradox of emotions that everyone feels coming towards this day. It's, it, there's not one right or one wrong or one way to look at Gimel Tamas or the Histalkos. And when we talk about the idea, which hopefully we unpack together and we really hope this could be interactive, that's, that's our goal. <laughs> um, when, we, when we unpack the idea of this gashras, of this connection, this bond, this neshama bond that we have, and what that means, and what that feels like, and what that looks like at different phases of our life, different stages of our life. Um, as women, we go through so many different, um, well, ups and downs, lots of different phases and stages. Let's just keep it at that for now. And it looks and feels different at different points in our lives. Sometimes we feel more plugged in, more connected, more anchored, more grounded. Sometimes we don't even know what the word grounded means and we're just feeling so out of sorts or so uncomfortable. Ladies, come join us. Come in, we have plenty of room. These are the special VIP seats we save for you. <laughs> and, and we really hope to share together tonight our thoughts, our feelings, and we really hope to hear from all of us as Hasidim, as we gather, what this means and, uh, and where we go from here. So I was, ha I was sharing with a friend. A friend saw that this rubbering was happening tonight, and she said, oh, wow, amazing. How do you feel? I said, really, really uncomfortable. She said, why do you feel uncomfortable? And I said, this is way out of my league. This is dealing with the most intense and auspicious day for us as Chassidim with so many different feelings. And I, I like, who, like, what am I doing? Like, who am I to be sitting here having this conversation? And we went back and forth a little. I'm not gonna share the voice notes, but one thing she mentioned, she said, remember us. I said, us? What do you mean us? She said, remember those of us who feel jealous and disconnected that we're not feeling connected. And I, Baruch Hashem, have spent a lot of time with high schoolers and seminary girls, and I feel like this word hiskashras can mean so many things to so many people, and it's really can be laden with feelings of inadequacy, feelings of sadness from, from past experiences and memories, feelings of jealousy and envy. I don't have what you have or your experiences. And it could be filled with feelings of like, how do I get this? How do I attain this? How do I leave this day, this time, a stronger, more anchored, more connected person who has more clarity of who I am and where I'm headed. So, I'm, go for it. We're, we're, we're doing this in a very, like, we're, we, we just wanna share and please feel free. I'm Manya Lazar from College Station, Texas. I forgot I'm supposed to introduce us. Shluchan <laughs> College Station, Texas. Shani Katzman from Omaha, Nebraska. And Achama Slanim from Houston, Texas, Rice University. Shlucha. And my niece. Okay, so I'm going to echo what Manya said, that I don't feel like we are the ones that belong up here sharing and, and uh, uh, inspiring or leading this conversation because this is a very deep, serious, giant conversation that is for the very great people. But what I'd like to share, or what helps me think about Gimel Tamas, is how the Rebbe thought and felt and shared with us the passing of his Rebbe. That's 
That's what we have available to us. And so I actually went back to Tafshin Yud and I looked through those pages of the early Tyrus Menachem, the Sichas that the Rebbe said in those very early days after Yud Shvat. And on Achrin Shal Pesach, in that year, the Rebbe spoke about something incredible. The Rebbe quoted the story in the Gemara where Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, is getting ready to pass away. And he calls his sons in. And by the way, this is from the Gemara. I, I, I could tell you where it is. I think it's Daf. I, I think it's Ksubas, Kuf Gimel, Ahmed Aleph. Um, and the Rebbe calls his, his sons in, and he says these words, Lebanai ani tsarich. I need my children. I'm going to the other world now, and I need you. And Rebbe continues and says, I want you to make sure that the candle is always burning in its place. I want you to make sure that my table is always set the way it needs to be set, and that my bed is always spread out and prepared for me. And the Rebbe says, the Rebbe takes the analogy, or the Rebbe looks at the story of Rebbe and says, imagine a tzaddik is moving from this corporal, physical, material world, and he's going up into the celestial terrain, the celestial experience, and he's going higher and higher. How could he possibly, how could we possibly have a connection with him? But before he goes out the door, he says, I need my children, and I need you to do this for me. I need, you, I need your help. Please, please keep my candle burning. Please keep my table set. Please keep the bed made. And the Rebbe explains, what does this mean? The Rebbe says, you know, we all have a relationship with the Rebbe. When we would go into Yechidus or, or whatever that means, when we would connect to the Rebbe in a personal way, there's two channels. We either meet with the Rebbe for Ruchnius things, or we meet with the Rebbe for Gashmiyastik things. So the Rebbe said, the Rebbe is there for us in the same way. The candle is burning, the table is set, the, the, the bed is made. What are these things? The Rebbe says, Bagashmias, the candle burning is Chaya, right? We, the, the, the three brachas that we need are Bana, Chaya, Umizaina. The candle is Chaya. Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam. The table is, is Mizaina, sustenance. And the bed is Bana. So the, the Rebbe says you could still come to the Rebbe for the brachas and all of these things. How does this apply, Baruchnius? The Rebbe says we know that every mitzvah is a candle. Kiner mitzvah. The Rebbe says the 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 Torah is mazain, while Torah still has the 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 qualifications of a, of a mitzvah. It has something more that it's mazain for the neshama. It satiates the neshama. And the third thing is the bed. What is the bed? The Rebbe says when a person lays on the bed, the head and the feet are the same. And this is when a person trips up and makes a mistake, and the Ruach Shtus comes into them, and they're, they're like an animal. They're, they're, flat, they're laying flat, where the head and the feet are on the same level. And the Rebbe says that the, the Rebbe can help you with this too. The Rebbe can help you to come out of this, just in the same way that the Rebbe did it when he was here, the Rebbe continues to do it. But the Rebbe says, the fact that we need the Rebbe, that goes without saying. But think about it. The Rebbe says, Lebanai ani tzarech. I need you. What does that mean? Um, you're, you're, you, you touch upon something that you see throughout a lot of the letters that we were, we're learning, we've learned, 
and a lot of the sikhas and this, some of our discussion that we had um, together. And I think often it can feel, I, I could say for myself, I can't speak for anyone else's feelings or experiences, but I could feel like, how do I connect to this day? How do I connect to the Rebbe? How do I connect to how, what this thing called Hiskashras, which is, it's like what, it's like bigger. It's, it's the enormity of it is tremendous. And how does that influence and affect every single day of my life? And I know Nahama, and maybe I'm going to pass the mic to you, but I know we, we, you, one of the areas we were talking about is repeated again and again and again in, in the Sikhas. And like you were saying, Shani, that the Rebbe really showed us what gave us a, fo- a, a map, directions of how to handle many aspects of our lives, but specifically, as you were articulating, right, that you look at the Sikhas from after the Stalkas of the Friedrich Rebbe, and you're looking at how the Rebbe, and I know you said this quite a few times, how the Rebbe continuously, the Rebbe the Shver, continuously kept the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe's life and mission and identity so forward and present for all of us. And the, the Rebbe modeled for us so many things and taught us through the way the Rebbe interacted with these ideas what our roadmap is because it could feel very, I mean, it's heavy, it's intense, and, and sometimes feeling, it could feel lost and overwhelming. But one thing that kept recurring, and I'm probably gonna pass the mic to Nahama because I would love her to expand on this, is that one of the things that the Rebbe kept repeating, again, throughout all the sikhs that ever address how to connect to the Friedrich Rebbe, was if you want to connect, it's through learning the Rebbe's Maimarim and Sichas, through learning how the Friedrich Rebbe approached life and the world, right? And for us, learning the Rebbe's Sichas and the Rebbe's um, approach or mindset to dealing with life circumstances, through learning the letters, right? The letter is like you, w- different people, different times. But I, I want to pass the mic to Nahama because Nahama really, yeah, thank you, <laughs> was sharing about what that looks like, learning, because there's no shortcut and there's no replacement, but there, that is such a recurring instruction of how we can connect. And for some of us, carving out the time is easier. <laughs> some of us, more challenging at different stages and phases, but Nahama. Um, first of all, I want to echo what they were saying about feeling very inadequate to be speaking on this topic on such a day. Um, I tried getting myself out of this. I'm still not sure why I'm here. Um, But I think that on such a, on on other, 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 if you think of Yudalf Nissen or Heiteves, it may be easier for me to be able to think about Hiskashras in a more, I guess, proactive way. Um, on a day like Gimel Tamas, where me being born after Gimel Tamas, um, very lucky to be born into a family of Hasidim, of course, but still not being able to be there, Begashmius, in the ways that many of you here were. Um, I think that it invokes a lot of emotion in this process of trying to think about what do I have to say. I think I have nothing to say other than that, uh, you know, I hope that we do get reunited with the Rebbe very soon. Um, You know, we were talking about a lot of different things and hearing the different stories as we all hear different kinds of thoughts and sentiments from many different people that can be very inspiring. I often find myself Um, feeling envious, like you mentioned, and just wishing that I had that opportunity as well. And I, it like dawned on me that it kind of, it kind of, I kind of compared it to, I guess, the generation that was able to receive the Tyra at Har Sinai, where they're able to like see it and feel it um, and hear it. And I guess my generation, um, I see some of you here with us, um, being that generation that are kind of like the children of that generation, that were the guarantors of the Tyra, um, and how that, with that, I carry a responsibility, right, to be able to carry that forward, 
at the same time, I, if I'd be really honest, I think that it's, it's something that feels maybe heavy to carry because sometimes, um, you know, you look around and we're in the scholars and the fact that we're still here, why are we still here? And trying to impart this connection to our kids when, you know, we should have been out of this position a long time ago. So I guess when I, when I think about this day, I, I feel a very, you know, I, I know, in a certain sense, if I'd be very honest, it's like, I don't, I feel uncomfortable. I, I don't know why we're still here. I don't know how I could be sitting here and trying to speak to anybody about this. Um, other than that, I know that, you know, what's the world that we are engaging with, the situations that each of every person has, every type of struggle, no one is a stranger to that. Um, that one thing I do know is that there's no way we could carry forward without having that point of connection. Um, so I guess part of this is being able to inspire each other and in how to bring that forward within ourselves because ultimately we, s we spoke about a lot of different sikhas and a lot of different things and they all sound very beautiful but we have to really take it to the next level and, and internalize it and be able to, to live with it. And going back to what I was saying about Har Sinai, the, the children still weren't able to see and hear in person, but they did receive the Tyra, and it is something that they were able to have. And in one of these four letters that we've, um, that we've read together, um, I think it was the letter to Baba Mayer, I think is what he goes by, Harav Mayer, Bukhat Sarah. Um, I think, I don't remember what number it was, but the Rebbe basically, at s the Rebbe talks about, of course, as we all know, the importance of, of studying the Rebbe's Taira. We all know that. Uh, we all have different ways that we can do that. Um, but something that I thought was maybe interesting was that the Rebbe says that the importance of studying the Rebbe's Maimarim and that's the way to be able to connect to the Rebbe and that it's not enough just to, I, th I forget the exact words, but to envision the Rebbe in their mind. And in a way, I feel like being this generation of the guarantors, if I may say that, um, but this next generation who, in a certain sense, we can't even envision. Of course, we're so lucky to have the videos and, and the pictures and everything that we have that we can carry in a physical way, but in a way we're kind of stuck with the most direct mode of connection, which the Rebbe said is through learning, um, the Rebbe's Taira, and I do have to say that although um, that, that'll look differently, I know for every person and for every stage that everyone is going through, um, but it doesn't take away from the importance of finding and increasing ways to be able to, I guess, nourish that relationship with the Rebbe. So, yeah, I don't, I, I think you're saying, I feel like, I feel like Nechama is saying at the end of the day, this is the generation that we're in. And if the Abishir put us exactly where we are, we're here for a reason. So it's not a mistake. It's not like the Abishir is asleep and like on an island and forgot that we're here. This is, this is what, this is our generation's responsibility, our generation's mission, our generation's task. This is what we have to do. And, but we're not left without direction and instruction. And I think, I mean, I mean we know, we can look, and, and uh, you touched upon everyone learning at different stages or different ages or different times or different things. It's very interesting because if you notice the letters that we studied, the Rebbe addressed his kashras differently to different people. And there were certain common threads and there were certain things that like when the Rebbe was in, I think letter number four and the Rebbe was talking to that, the, the woman who was feeling very guilty about where she was holding spiritually or where she was as a person or you know, what her spiritual standing was or what that meant or what that would look like. Um, the Rebbe addressed her based on who she was and how she came to the table in her letter. Um, and you see that, that yet the common thread is always learning and always doing. Lear yeah, yeah I was learning and doing. Right, I was just gonna say, I think we're putting a lot of emphasis on the learning, which is very, very important, but I think the, the idea is for each of us to look in the mirror. You know, the Rebbe always used the expression, yoda inash binafshei. Every person knows their own capability. Everybody knows their own capacity. You look in the mirror. You see what can you do. You know, whether it's when you leave here tonight, give someone a ride. You know, the Rebbe Miftzah Avas Yisrael, or 
you know, uh, put, some, uh, put, a, put some money in the pushkas, you're going into the oil, writing a pun. Each of, each of these things that you're doing are part of the whole framework of his kashras. So it's not just learning, and it's not just learning lukadusichas, or learning letters, or hayoyim yoyim, or learning chitas, like the Rebbe wants us to do, or learning rambam, it's that, and ha uh, the miftzayim, and avas yisrael, and, and whatever it is that tickles your fancy, if I could s say it in the most, you know, down-to-earth way. If it tickles your fancy, and if it jives with your personality, that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. And there's, there's a whole smorgasbord of opportunities that the Rebbe has given us, whether you're working, you know, whether you're in chinuch, whether you're in business, whether you're a shliach, whatever you are and wherever you are, where, wherever you, are you have the, the, the capacity to be mekusher to the Rebbe. And I just actually noticed at, in the Eihel, there was, or in the, in the house, there was a video playing, and it's such a simple thing, the Rebbe or deceptively simple. The Rebbe says, what is his kashras? His kashras is, I mean, in Hebrew, if you speak, if you speak Hebrew, lehit kasher, you know, to, to connect, right? A kasher, 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 shalkayama, right? We're all familiar with the language. It's a knot, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bond, it's a connection. The Rebbe says you take one thing and you take another thing, they're two separate things, and you tie them together and they become one. Imagine the enormity and the magnitude that there we are separate who we are, simple, we know who we are, and the Rebbe who is indescribable, and we're able to take these two separate entities and tie the two entities together to become one. And the Rebbe says, and, and once it becomes one, it's not two separate pieces that are together, it literally becomes one mitzias. It's one thing. So now, the hiskashras has brought us to be one, meaning that wherever you are and whatever you do, the Rebbe is with you. The Rebbe is a part of you. So interesting because in one of the letters, I think it was the I think it was the third week. There was a second letter, a shorter letter, um, I think. Um, but in, in it, the Rebbe, it, it's it's a. Um, I th it was to a man named Oh gosh, I'm going to mess up the name, Mr. Stolman or something. I think that was it. Did anyone see that letter? Um, the Rebbe was basically saying it was after the Salkos of the Friedrich Rebbe, and the Rebbe was saying that. The, the Rebbe's presence hasn't changed. It changed in how it's like almost the Rebbe used a, an analogy of transmission of energy and that, that it's, it's basically a different plane of connection and that basically what the, when, when after, and the Rebbe was talking about after Yud Shvat, that the, that the basically the Friedrich, to access the connection to the Friedrich Rebbe, and of course the Rebbe says following in the Friedrich Rebbe's ways, being passionate and like Shani was mentioning, as Hasidim, I always say, as Hasidim, we have no shortage of things to do. Like, it's, it's not like we can't figure out what to do next to make an impact in the world. The world needs us, every single one of us, wherever we find ourselves, and it needs us to step up but, and, and level up. You know, like really, really step into the next role of what we can do wherever we find ourselves. And I, I'm so passionate about what you were just saying because it's, it's true. That's, what, that's the only way we're going to get out of Gullis. That's the truth. We're all needed. We're, none of us are like extra here. But in, it, the, the, in that letter, the Rebbe was saying that basically the Friedrich Rebbe is challenging the Hasidim to shift how they connect to the Friedrich Rebbe. So the Rebbe's energy didn't change. The Rebbe's energy passed on to a different world, but in, uh, the, the Neshama of a Tzaddik, the energy of a Tzaddik remains, remains connected. As a matter of fact, the Rebbe even makes the point that it's not limited now by, by a body, by time, by space, by all the things that limit us. You know, as I'm sure as women, we always feel like we think we, we want to be at two places at once, or you're, anyone relate to being pulled in multiple directions at the same time? No? Oh. Okay, good. A few of you laughed. That's not just me. I appreciate that. Um, especially just getting kids off the camera because we we're not going to talk about that tonight. Um, but the point is that the point is that we feel we're constantly being pulled, and 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 the reb and but the but the reb is saying to this man that the that the that the um, Friedrich Reb is challenging him to connect differently through learning, through doing, through. W walking in what the Friedrich Rebbe's passionate ways were, and obviously we know as 
people in this generation, again, the Rebbe left us no shortage of instructions of, of what to do. It's not like we could ever be really bored if we wanted to. She'll take it soon. <laughs> okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share another story. This is a story that is very well known. It's another story from the Gemara. And uh, I guess in my search for looking for inspiration, uh, where the Rebbe speaks about the passing of the Friya de Rebbe, or where the Rebbe speaks about difficult times and difficult challenges, um, it's a very well known story. The story of Rabbi Akiva and his fellow Chachamim who are traveling to Yerushalayim. We all know the story. We say Rabbi Akiva laughed, the uh, Talmud Chachamim cried. And uh, he then at the end, the, the conclusion of the story is Akiva Nechamtanu, Akiva Nechamtanu. But the Rebbe tells the story, and by the way, it's a, it's, it was a whole Fabrengen. In Tavshin Chafe, this is a Siam on the Mesechta, which on Yud Shvat, which the Rebbe did in honor of, his, of Rebbe Tzanchana, who passed away that year. So the Rebbe tells the story and starts from earlier in the Gemara. Rabbi Akiva and these three other Chachamim are going to Yerushalayim, and they come to Har HaTzaifim, which is Mount Scopus. It's where you can see the entire uh, Chorban of Yerushalayim. And they all rend their garments. They see the tragedy, they see the calamity, they see the terrible situation that the Yidin are in, and they all rip their clothes, including Rabbi Akiva. Then, when they get to the Har Habayis, all of a sudden they see a fox running out from the Kaidish HaKadoshim, and there the three Chachamim cry, and Rabbi Akiva, the Rebbe's word is Eret Gekvelt. Not that he was laughing. Laughing is ha, ha, ha. Gekvelt is a word that, that everybody who had a Jewish grandmother in Omaha knows. Kvel means that you, you have pleasure. Rabbi Akiva Gekvelt. So the Rebbe used the word Kvelt. Now in, in, in the Lashon of the Gemara, it's Mitzachik, but the Re in the Yiddish, the Rebbe used the word Er Kvelt, Eret Gekvelt. And they said to him, Ma what are you cr what are you laughing? And the Rebbe says, so he answers them like a Jew answers with a question. Ma atem why are you crying? And of course they say, look, you know, look what's going on here. And Rabbi Akiva says, look, we are seeing the nevuah of Uriah. For sure, the, the nevuah of Zechariah is going to come to be. Till now, we didn't know for sure that the nevuah of the destruction was so serious. So we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't know, we didn't have the, 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 the confidence what's going to happen. But now that we saw what happened, we know for sure it's going to be good. And they say, Akiva Nechamtanu. Akiva Nechamtanu. Not once, but twice. Akiva Nechamtanu. Twice. And the Rebbe, of course, never takes anything at face value and takes apart the entire story. And the Rebbe proves, the Rebbe says, look, Rabbi Akiva was not oblivious to the tragedy. Rabbi Akiva was not clueless to how much suffering was going on. He was right there with them. When they saw the terrible destruction, they all rent their garments. They all ripped their clothes. Yes, this is terrible. This is absolutely terrible. And then when they came to the Kedush HaKadoshim, the place where the Kedush HaKadoshim used to be, oh, then they totally fell apart. Because this is horrific. And there Rabbi Akiva saw the kernel of positivity and transformation. Rabbi Akiva saw in the... In the in the, tra in the tragedy, in the challenge, in the struggle, in the disaster, he saw the redemption. So Rabbi Akiva was really straddling the two worlds. He was on the one hand mourning deeply, he was ripped clothes, and on the other hand, he was in ecstasy. Eret Gekvelt. He was Pashat Machaya, beautiful. And 
in a way, this describes exactly, exactly how each of us feel on Gimel Tamos. You know, we were talking about this, and I, and I said, you know, Gimel Tamos was something those of us that were alive at that point, if you call that living, um, if we did not believe that such a thing could come to pass. It was impossible. We were going to live, and I see whoever's nodding was there, we were going to live with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe was going to take us to the Ula Shlema, and that was, that what was, was what was going to happen. That was the only option. It wasn't even that, oh, the only option, you know, because the other option, it, it was happening. It was happening. And here we were thrust into this unbelievable, shocking experience. And, you know, looking back, Baruch Hashem, we've, came, we've come many years too long in the same situation, but we have learned a lot on the way on how to tackle this. And the Rebbe keeps showing us, Nacha Bissel, Nacha Bissel, Nacha Bissel. We're almost there, we're almost there, we're almost there. Can we, can we say that we're, it's a Fabrangian, could we just be there already? I mean, like, really, we're, we're really ready for the Gula Shlema. Like, it's not even a question. Like, we're, 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 we're there. We're ready. Um, so, Nachama, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, what you're saying is, is really very powerful. It makes me, it makes me, th it reminds me of this dichotomy, I guess, that we're all feeling that, like, on the one hand, when, you know, we talk about his gosh, we talk about the Rebbe's love, the connection, being really plugged in. To me, a lot of it is really, like, I understand it through a lot of the stories of people, that people like you share, and through watching the way the Rebbe interacted with people and hearing the way people experienced the Rebbe in person. And I think of it as, I guess, something that, um, like, again, not, you know, on the one hand, something that I don't really get to feel in its entirety because I, I think of, I think of the word love. I think of, I think of my father coming to embrace me. It's a sensation that I literally feel in my body. It's something that, you know, we, we, we really get to, get to feel in person. On the one hand, we are more connected than ever. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you know, we really feel this void, really having this, like, you know, n sometimes not feeling that that same kind of intimate connection in a way that I think others um, have experienced, not even by choice, but because they merited to. Um, it's just, uh, just to fo not to fo dwell on this for too much, but I was thinking about just recently there was a student who um, lost her mother, and I was just speaking with her about it, and we were, I just, I don't know how, but I found myself telling her that, you know, your mother must be so proud of you in the fact that you're more engaged with your Yiddishkeit, you're, you're wanting to learn more Tyra, and then all of a sudden I, I like just really cringed at myself because I, I felt very bad about what I was saying, because I, I, how can I say that? This girl doesn't have her mother. She is she wants her mother next to her. And although, sh although we may know that that's true, um, I don't think that it's a complete experience the way that it should be. Um, on the other hand, you know, we, we know from the way the Rebbe spoke about the Friedrich Rebbe and how, and how the, Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe said when he was leaving Russia, he assured his chassidim that their connection is, is, is not limited by borders and isn't limited by the physical separation that, um, that they were experiencing. And we see this, you know, in the stories of how the Chassidim remained connected to the Friedrich Rebbe and how this is obviously also true with our, um, with our Rebbe. And again, we see it, and the Rebbe goes on in the Secha to, to talk about how the fact that there is this idea of Zari Bachayim, the fact that I'm here, that we're all here still trying to figure out how to connect and how to be in tune and plugged in to obviously the only way that we could get through um, what's going on around us, the only way that we could get to the finish line is through having that connection. Um, that that in of itself is a testament to the fact that the life of the Rebbe was kulay ruchni, was completely 
um, I guess, above any limitation. Because it's not so much, of course, it comes with the responsibility of being able to do what the Rebbe wants from us, but it's also just shows us that it's really nothing that we're doing. It's the fact that the Rebbe is the Rebbe there and, and is completely unlimited um, that there's able to be this testament of all of us sitting here, of you know the shluchim all over the world, of every chassid who's still maintaining and searching and, and looking for that connection because we all need it. Um, so it's just this very... Okay, I, I, you touched upon something that really kept coming up again. Mazar b'chaim, afu b'chaim, mazar b'chaim, afu b'chaim. And I, I, on a very personal level, I was 14 when, when, when Gimel Tamas happened at that time. And I wasn't in an environment with a lot of, of people who were coming from the same community and the same background. And I recall that there were quite a few, uh, let's just say naysayers, who were like, ha, now you Chabadniks. <laughs> where I lived, whatever, among me and my other Chabad friend, they, a lot of people were ready to, um, I'm not going to say gloat, because that's a, maybe a strong word, but they were like, now what, you guys? Like, really? Mashiach now? Like, now what? And I, I've probably because I'm a little bit stubborn, it was like fuel for me. Like, like wh what do you mean? The Rebbe's life, the Rebbe's vision, I pr was probably planted a lot of the seeds of what like impassioned me to like, on, to go on shulchas to, to make a difference in the world and to continue, to try to continue to, to follow the Rebbe's Haras and try to change the world, which all of us, again, the Rebbe really handed that responsibility to all of us. Um, and I remember following a few years later, I met up with that, that group, that social group. It was me and another uh, girl, for another Chabadnik, and and she said, we were talking about where we were over the summer, and we said we were somewhere on Shluchus, the middle of nowhere, USA. I think we were, we were in Alabama. She says, you guys are 16, and you think you could change the world. Like, you Lubavitchers, what is that? And I think that when we look at this idea of Chaim, of Afu Chaim, look at the world. When I spend time with, let's say, our Lubavitcher high schoolers, or, or, or when I, wherever you are in the world, when I get regards from a student that they're in Venice and they're put on tefillin and the shulchim there reached out and the, the connection, it's, it's like, it's mind boggling and it's humbling because all of us have it and all of us are really charged with that achrayis to, and galus, to move forward. I'm gonna, get, uh, one second, I'm gonna pass it to you, but I had one st a situation where there was um, a, one of my students mothers called me, we're touching base, and she says she's having a massive dilemma. And I said, you know, give tzedakah, say a couple to him, and I send her a link to the aisle, I say, write upon. Here's a lady in the middle of nowhere, Texas, and she says, okay. And I'm like, you know what? It's bigger than me, it's bigger than you. <laughs> you need a bracha from above. You need the Rebbe, you need a bracha from the Rebbe. She, I don't, I don't know if it, she knew what it meant, but I, I tried to give her a lens in, and I said, "Here's a website, explore it." But right, okay. A year later, I'm meeting up with her in Dallas, and she says again, she's describing a different crisis she's going through, and I said, "You know, you really need to." She said, "But whatever you tell me, I'll listen to." Now I'm not used to hearing whatever you tell me, I'll listen to. I have teenage children, like I have, I've worked with high schoolers. It's not the general mo. Like, sure, whatever you say, I'll listen to. I have a husband, whatever, you know, whatever. <laughs> Saying, you know, it's how life. So she says, "Whatever you say, I'll listen to." And I'm like, "Okay, caught me by surprise, obviously." So I said to her, "Really?" She said, "Yeah, because last year your your spiritual advice." brought miracles. And I'm like, what spiritual advice brought miracles? I didn't even remember that we had a conversation a year before. She says, remember that crisis, whatever. There was a whole a situation with a lawsuit. She says, the next day after I wrote that letter to the Rebbe, I got um, a, a call from my lawyer that the whole case is dropped. I'm writing today. So then her Son is the wife is pregnant, the child had a challenge, and I'm speaking to, in utero, there was a problem. She said, don't worry, I'm writing to the Rebbe. What I'm saying is, in, in a lot of the sikhas, afu b'chaim, it means through, and, 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 and uh, the Yud-Bes Talmud sikha that we, I think it went around on Chem WhatsApp yesterday, they were saying, with, through you, amongst, the Rebbe is amongst you, with you, and through you connected to everyone. That means that we have this gift of a connection, of iskashras, of a nasiadar, and we can we can't hog it ourselves. 
We have to share it. So share it with the Sarahs, with the Stacys, with the Khanis, with everyone. I'm passing it on. I think it's even bigger than that. I mean, it's, it's bigger than, you know, what there is. For example, when you say, Afu Bahayim, how many women in the world are wearing Shaitlach today, not Lubavitchers, modern Orthodox? It's, it's a thing. It's a thing, and everyone does it. Or the fact that the governor of the state of Nebraska would call the Shliach and say on his cell phone, and say, hey, Rabbi, when are we doing the menorah lighting? I mean, what has the Rebbe done in this world? And how is the Rebbe living? You know, during COVID, countless reform congregations had menorah lightings in their parking lots. Reform congregations and menorah lightings in their parking lots. It's wild. It's wild. The Rebbe is alive. It's, it's hard because we have, this, we have this struggle. We have this reality and, you know, the paradox. But I just want to go back to the story for a moment that the, that, uh, the Rebbe elaborated on where the, Rebbe speaks, where the Rebbe explains the conversation between Akiva, Rebbe Akiva, and the other Chachamim. And the Rebbe says... When, when the Chachamim say, uh, why are you laughing? And Rabbi Akiva answers the question with a question and says, it's not, it's not like a, a, you know, a, a, a cute question. The Rebbe is saying, Rabbi Akiva is, a call, is calling them to action. He's saying, now is not the time to cry. Now is not the time to cry. Number one, look at the promise. Look at the potential. Look at what's possible to accomplish. Look at how we can transform the reality. And what are we going to do now? Now is not the time for crying. We have to do. Um, I, I think, I'll, I'll be honest, in our conversations that we went through this week, it, they, they, they took a long journey, and some of it was a little heavy and a little dark. It was, it was, because Gallus is heavy and dark, and because the fact that we're sitting here 28 years later is ridiculous and should not, is not okay. And, um, but at a certain point, I was, I was referencing, I think it was during COVID, there was a positivity bias, there was a class on it, and I, I remember doing it because I, I think I probably, I like to teach what I need to learn because that's the best way for me to learn. And um, so I, I obviously need a little more positivity in my life during that time period, so I, I started teaching that, the class on it. And I remember one thing that really struck me that I never thought about, I just didn't, you know you have those moments where you're like, oh, I, I never looked at it that way, like, that's interesting. Um, and it was describing being positive. <laughs> I mean, there's no shortage. We're not talking about toxic positivity, which is fake. No one is whitewashing the intensity of what we're feeling, right? Um, but in it, it was describing the Rebbe's life, the challenges, the struggles, the painful, difficult life that the Rebbe led leading up to taking on Vinicius, and obviously throughout the Rebbe's life, two world wars, right? World War I, World War II, a family impri imprisonment, is, you know, disconnect from the parents, uh, family dying in the Holocaust. I mean, tremendous, tremendous Nisianus. And, the, and I, I don't even remember why it was brought up, because I don't remember the exact thing, but it was such a shift to me to think, we epitomize the Rebbe's legacy, the Rebbe's identity is positivity how to reframe things, how to re-say things, how to understand things in a different way, right? Not even saying someone who's distant, someone who, you know, someone who's not, you know, saying someone who's not close, or say, not saying a, you know, do, a, do, a deadline, but saying a due date. There's so many little ways where the Rebbe really trained, ra raised us to see the world through a positive lens. And I think that we, taking the intensity of the, this, 
sh this next few days. And I, the truth is, really, I really, really, like, if, like I'm ready for Mashiach, for Gimel Tamas, uh, um, uh, we still have time, no problem. We're all ready. But taking that moving forward, to take that, like, now what? And how does that affect me? And how, what can I do about this? And I, I, someone, I really feel, for me, it, it really pushes me to say, okay, what can I do? How can I, how can I affect change? And it, it doesn't mean we don't acknowledge the feelings and the, the intensity and the difficult emotions of the gullus that we're in. It's, it, again, it's, we, how many times did we say it's not okay this week? It's not okay. <laughs> but to say, what can I do about that? And where does that take me? Um, I'm just, again, thinking about, you know, the Rebbe talks about in the, the famous mimer about Kassis Lama'ar. And I think what we're basically saying is that everyone feels that Kassis, right? The fact that it's been so long. But I think, how are we paying that forward, I guess? How are we taking that to Lama'ar? How are we taking this, I guess, this yearning that many of us feel and pushing ourselves to connect more? I think we all know what that should look like for each of us. I, we all have, I don't think there's one recipe. The Rebbe gave us pretty clear instruction that we could translate into our lives. If you're a mommy with little kids, if you have, everyone has their different, you know, situation that they apply their hiskashras um, and they're, you know, plugging in more. But I think that we can just, like what, like what, Mrs. Katzman um, was saying is that, you know, we, ca we can just sit here and cry, even though it is, it is painful, it is confusing, trying to raise children with having that deep and intimate connection is something which is strange, and I'm not really comfortable doing it. Um, I'm ready to shirk that responsibility that they can see the rabbi with their own eyes and see and feel and, you know, and hear, um, but I also, know that this yearning has to translate into something proactive um, and incorporating more ways of, I guess, you know, there's this expression that actually Rabbi Yehuda Dukes al was, I had, I was, I worked for him. He was a very special person, as many of you have seen um, during the last, you know, he was, I guess, a public source of inspiration along with his wife. Um, and I, I worked for Jaina for a few months, or a little more than a few months, when I was living in Kern Heights after I was married. And he shared this on a very, for a very technical reason. He was telling me I was doing like certain data entry, I guess, for connecting people who wanted to learn with their chavrusas. And he, he wanted that all the data going in should be very um, accurate and as thorough as possible. And he shared with me this expression called data in, data out. That however good the input is, um, into your Excel sheet, that's how powerful of a system you can create and that's how powerful this data can be. And I was just thinking about this idea that it's so true to, I guess, you know, to, to so many things, but in this conversation, I think that we also have to be honest about how are we, how are we nurturing, how are we plugging in, what kind of data are we putting in that we should be able to have that connection. And I don't know that it always has to come with a feeling, it would be nice if it always does, but it's definitely doing something because we're putting that data in, we're connecting to the source of Chayim, right? We're connecting to the only thing that can carry us through this, um, through this craziness that we have to, I guess, pay it forward and, and put the data in and we all have to find those ways to, to do that and I think that it's a process, it's not overnight. We're all used to this like instant Amazon delivery like three times a day, um, you know, I mean, I am. <laughs> yeah, you know, all this stuff, but it's not something that happens overnight and I think that it's, I'm talking to myself here, that it's important not to be, you know, pulled down by not always feeling that, but knowing that if I am connecting to the source, there, it's going to it's going to influence my my yeah. my behavior, my actions, and I think, yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah, just one more thought on that note is thinking about you know we hear all these beautiful stories about, um, about I mean not really on that note but it just made me think of this that uh, on the Rebbe's the way 
looking at the way the Rebbe interacted with so many different people and the Rebbe's love to each person and the Rebbe's ability to be able to really like understand their intimate, personal, emotional, physical needs despite the Rebbe's greatness and the Rebbe's you know, really high, high stature and everything else is, is really beautiful and we could talk about it, we could bring about it. But then I also think like at some point I was like thinking about this, it's very beautiful, but how are we taking it? And I guess, how is that data going and applying into the way that we're interacting in our lives? Like how are we, as Hasidim of the Rebbe, we have a responsibility to represent the things that the Rebbe embodied. And I think that, you know, how am I taking that Avis Yisrael, the way the Rebbe looked at every person and applying it to the way I interact with my spouse, the way that I interact with the people in my shluchas, the way I interact to my children, the way I interact with, you know, my friends and people who I meet. So I think that there's also taking, you know, that is a way of being able to live the way the Rebbe wants us to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what you said about the, the data in, data out. Show repeat it, show repeat it. So she's asking, what kind of data do we need to put in to get the output that I she that I want? It's, it's not about all of us. Oh. <laughs> 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 on the hot seat. <laughs> um, well, for starters, I could I could know. I think I, I think it's going to be unique to every person, and I think that although we have. <laughs> so I think for me, I mean, it's very obvious to me that the way that I get that that feeling of, I guess, clarity or where I feel that direction in a, in a more clear in t way that I could be more in tune with is, I think, through learning. Um, I think I know is through learning. I feel like if I want to feel, if I want to be in tune to the things that I want to be doing and I want to actually be acting on them, I need to kind of drink directly from that well. So for me, um, I wish I did more of it, but I think that, I think that, I try to push myself, and I know that we all can in our own way to incorporate a little bit more of kind of connecting straight to that, to the Mayan that we have. Um, I think there's different elements of it. I think that through writing to the Rebbe and having like a relationship in a way that, um, I think that that helps, that helps me, I guess, feel that intimacy that I guess I miss, I, I so often wish I had more of. Um, but I, I think that it's clear from the way the Rebbe spoke to us, and I, and for sure from the from the the impact that I find that it has in my life, it gives me a certain sense of clarity, short-lived, something I have to constantly um, rejuvenate. And uh, right, and I, I think that there's also the fact that we really don't. It doesn't come from ourselves. I think that the only way that we can get that is through the plugging in, because through learning. Um, yeah, that's, that's I, the only I want to add with learning because I, I the third letter s just jumped out at me so much. No, letter number four would jumped out at me. The, m the woman with feeling guilty. I just think that's such a natural uh, uh, place that we go to. And um, it really, actually, the guilt, we obviously know Tanya discusses extensively where guilt actually takes us. It's not to a productive place. So I, I, feel, I feel like, I, I, I re it resonated so much with me, that letter, the last letter, because there was this woman who's clearly struggling with who she is and where she's holding. And, and one line that jumped out at me that's like playing over in my head, where she's obviously feeling inadequate to receive whatever her connections, the brachas, and, and the Rebbe basically says in the, the letter to her, we had a great Rebbe and we have a great Rebbe. Meaning the Rebbe's greatness is still something that every single one of us, no matter how we feel, because to me, this woman represented so many of us who maybe were taking a look and saying like, who am I and where am I holding? And I know where I was yesterday and I know where, how I am. And maybe I'm having imposter syndrome that I don't feel like I could stand up there as whatever it is, um, in my, show up in my life in that way, in a healthy way. And, 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 the Rebbe was like saying, and the Rebbe is davening for you, for you to have success in all areas of your life. 
begashmias, baruchnias, with your children, in all areas of your life, not whether you're worthy, whether you're not worthy. And it's so interesting because, again, remember I was saying earlier how the Rebbe sp- gave different ways to connect to different people. The Rebbe says, Close, look at a picture of the Rebbe. I think sometimes for me, that is a moment that for uh, his gosh, said, could you just like, all I can do right at that moment, just take a look. You know, someone, a student came in, you have this picture of the Rebbe in every room of your house. I said, I need it in every room of my house. <laughs> I'm in all the rooms, it needs to be there. Um, to have that, that, the connection, sometimes I think it's going to look like sitting down and drinking from the Mayan, and sometimes <sighs> I, I, I have, I, even a two minute gem clip came on my WhatsApp, I can't even get through because of whatever is on my to do list that day whether it's in here or actually the to-do list, right? So I think that we have to not wait till we, and I, uh, there's no substitute for learning. I think, yeah. I think you're cutting everyone a little bit short because I oh, think I that we often um, think that learning isn't for me. No, learning no, I isn't, I don't have the time, I'm not a learner. There's so much access to being able to learn the Rebbe's Tyra in a way that is completely unprecedented for women yes. for sure that we really don't have any excuses. No, no, I, I don't think, no, you know, no. like uh, with, with all my respect, I think no, no, that no, especially, no. I guess, being this generation where I do in a way feel like that is our, like, like that is what we have. And yeah. you know, like, like talking about the, the generation of the children, the next generation, of course there's, there's also the, the, the Rebbe cares about us in a way beyond just, it's not a, just an intellectual thing, but I think that the pro- like the Rebbe gave us this Tyra for us to tap into, yeah. that I think that we're doing an injustice by not give you know r- allowing ourselves to do more of it, and that doesn't mean to ignore that doesn't mean to ignore you know our dif- the different things that are calling us. I think that we all have so many things, but I think that we could all push ourselves more in this area because I think every woman, everyone who has ever you know, we all know what it does for us. And I think that everyone has maybe their own style of learning, their own way of connecting to the Rebbe's Tyra. Some people like to listen to something, like these letters that are on podcast form. Some people like to open up a secha. Some people can read something in English. There's so many incredible ways to be able to drink directly from the well that I think we have to... She's, she's saying I'm wrong. No, <laughs> I'm saying that for all of us, no, you're good. I think for all of us at different stages, we have to not wait till we could get exactly what we want to because I think sometimes, you know, sometimes perfection's the enemy of progress. Oh, 100%, 100%. But, but, but I'm not gonna wait till the once a month that I could, let's say, I to feel that connection. We have, have to stop putting ourselves in a box, I think. Uh, I, I hear you. Okay. I'm going to pass it to someone wiser. <laughs> so I wanted to say one thing, that yeah. in addition to the learning, that, and however you guys work it out between <laughs> yourselves, um, I think the, the, the critical thing to remember is Rebbe is Reish B'nai Yisrael. Yeah. The Rebbe is our head. And in another place, there, is there a bug in my head? Okay. okay. You got it. Okay. And then... Uh, you want to release it? Yes, I'm going to bring it back to its mom. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then, so, thank you very much, Maya. Well, thank you. Um, so, in addition to the fa- thank you. In addition to the fact that the Rebbe is our head, the Rebbe is also our heart. So the two most vital organs, the head and the heart, that's the Rebbe of our collective community and the whole world, really. So connecting with the limud of the Rebbe is critical. And in any way that you can, do it. But I also want to go back to what the Rebbe spoke about on Shmini Atzera, I mean on uh, Shvi, uh, sh- not Shvi, but Achan Shopesach, where the Rebbe said, Lebanai ani tzarech. If you feel you can't do it for you, could you do it for me? Could you please do it for me? In other words, and the Rebbe says in that sicha, of course it's obvious that we still need the Rebbe. Of course we need the Rebbe. Who are we? We're, we're, you know, we're yokels, we need the Rebbe, no question. But the Rebbe needs us. He says, I need you. And how do we 
How do we do what the Rebbe needs? By following what the Rebbe wants us from us, whether it's learning and with wha in whatever intensity you decide, I or... I think the intensity changes the Fine. A hundred percent. And doing what the Rebbe asked us to do. So I just think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different mindset. In other words, okay, for myself, maybe I'm, I don't have the energy. Maybe I don't have the, the, the drive. Maybe I don't have, I'm not incentivized. But how could I let the Rebbe down? He's waiting for you. He's asking you, please, I need you. No, you're reminding me of a story that when I read the story, it's in the new Here's My Story book. I think it's called My Story 2. Um, where the Rebbe talk, where the story just really touched me very deeply because there's the story at face value and then I kind of like saw it in a different way where basically there was this woman who was living in Crown Heights um, who was not, did not consider herself Lubavitch and she was very friendly, had a close connection with Rabbi J.J. Hecht um, and she confided in him that they were seriously considering adoption and Rabbi Hecht encouraged them to come to the Frida Rebbe to get a bracha before they do such a big you know, thing in their life. Um, so they did and when they came to the Frida Rebbe, he, Rabbi J.J. Hecht told them, told, told the Rebbe the situation and the Rebbe like, it says that the Rebbe laughed and said, you're definitely going to have children, you're going to have children and you're going to have healthy children. Anyways, Rabbi J.J. Hecht tells him, looks at him and says, and I'm going to be the Sandik. So anyways, they move on. It did take some time and they were still not yet having children. Um, it came to a point where this woman's doctor told her that she had to go through a procedure that would actually remove her ability to be able to have a child. Um, and they came to then the Rebbe, our Rebbe at that time, um, and and explain the situation. And the Rebbe told them to go see another doctor, um, which they did. And the Rebbe then connected them to Rebbe Tanchai Mushka's doctor, actually. And all the doctors were saying that it's a matter of life and death. She really has to go ahead with this procedure. Um, and they came back and to the Rebbe and basically said, like, it's, we really don't have a choice. And the Rebbe said, go see another doctor. They go see another doctor. And the doctor, af from after the consultation, whatever it is that they had, the doctor goes and schedules the time for the surgery and says, this is happening, you don't have a choice in the matter, and you know, this, this is what it is, you can't, you can't play around. So they come back to the rabbi and they basically say, we really appreciate your concern, but we really have to go ahead with this. And the rabbi tells this woman, can you please do me a favor? So the woman says, okay, fine, I'll, I'll do a favor. They had, she had respect to the rabbi, uh, of course, and she said, what's, what's the favor? And the rabbi said, can you please go find, go ask one more doctor? And it's just crazy to me how many doctors and how, you know, this defied, I guess, the, the physical reality. And she went and found another doctor. And of course, the doctor, um, after doing whatever it was that he checked, he said, I have a suspicion that she, that she was pregnant. And she ended up, she ended up being so. And she ends up saying, uh, and I, I think out of the story, obviously there's like a face value. It's an unbelievable, like, my fist, honestly. It's, it's crazy what, what, what happened. But I also think that it's really interesting how she was doing, she thought that she was doing the Rebbe a favor, that, sh that the Rebbe needed her to do this favor. And I also find it interesting the Rebbe ev even verbalized it that way, that to the Rebbe it was a favor, perhaps, because the Rebbe cares so deeply about her being able to have you know, this thing that she was yearning so strongly for. Um, but I also, what, I, what really like struck me about this was that, what really struck me about this was that she thought she was doing the Rebbe a favor and ultimately what was happening was she was getting the biggest gift. She was, you know, the Rebbe was doing her a favor by encouraging her to do this. So I think that sometimes we think about the kind of, maybe a certain like, oh, I guess, or a certain like, ha like, we like the Rebbe expects us of us and we have to do this and maybe it's not always in a way w we think we're doing the Rebbe a favor by you know being those Zari B'chai and by doing what the Rebbe wants but I think it's pretty clear that maybe that was a, an expression of love to allow us to to merit to be able to do those things because ultimately it's the biggest I think gift you know I don't know how it w we would be able to survive I mean I don't know if we are but if we <laughs> how we could you We're know here. the world is just getting more and more crazy by I think the day and I guess being on campus also it's just I just want to hide sometimes when and you know block my eyes and ears to the things that I'm seeing and 
it's the biggest gift I think that we have by being able to to, to plug in. Um, I, I think we're we're getting to a point where we're going to probably be wrapping shortly. Um, and I want to say that I I'm going to reiterate something that I feel like this gift is not just our gift, and the responsibility is not just our responsibility. Um, it's for each and every one of us at each and every place wherever we're at. And I, I, I've truly seen over the past um, 16 years, and actually happened, I was once in my, with my mother-in-law in Crown Heights in the year, in the, uh, right when we had moved on campus, and my mother-in-law asked me for a certain person, do I know this person's mother's name? I said, no, and it was, a, it was a young lady in her community, and she said, well, I'm, I'm going to the aisle, and I know her back was bothering her, so I wanna put in her name. And suddenly it like clicked like, oh my, I have so many students who are going through so many challenges. Some are struggling with dating the person that they should date. Some are struggling with many um, emotional challenges, just different things that they're really, really heavy. And at times I feel very, very inadequate to be the address that they're coming to for guidance, for advice, for whatever. Um, and I, I started just, I have actually a little Google Keep on my phone where I put different students, their names, their children's, now some of their children's names, where when I go to the aisle, I have them in mind. And I have, s I have I've really, truly, I one year it was Gimel Tamos, and I went and I texted the student, I realized I didn't have his name. And I said, I know you've been dating for a long time, it's not working, what can I, c give, me your, give me your name, your mother's name. He gave me his name, his mother's name, and he said, keep my sister in mind too. I didn't, I didn't, his sister was, he was European, he lived in France, I didn't, never met his sister. Okay, I'll keep, uh, who am I to say no, right? And the next time I went to the aisle, I had realized, I was sitting by the aisle again, and I pulled up my text to see the name, because I wanted to still put it in, he was not yet, and he said, you'll never, it was six, it was six, like six months later, he says, you'd never believe it, I met this girl, Manya, it was that day, perfect for me, and by the way, my sister just got engaged. And I just realized, how can I not can help connect? The neshama of a nasi, you, you touched upon this, is the neshama of the whole generation. It's not just for me and for my children. It's for each and every one of us, but it's also our responsibility to share this gift of his gashros, to nurture it and nourish it within ourselves, and to share it with obviously our children that they feel empowered and connected, but to share with every single neshama of this generation. Because the Rebbe is their, their Rebbe is their Rebbe. I, w I would extend it to all of mankind. Yeah. yeah. Finish up. Shani. <laughs> um, okay. Are, I'm, I, are we, it looks like we are ready for the next incredible part of this program. I want to say that we'll after, so not. not? No rush. Huh? No rush. No rush. Then I'm passing the mic to Shani. She has a lot more to say. <laughs> Go, okay. Um, you wanna say anything else? No. Okay, I, I will say this, and I guess we will wrap because if they don't wanna share anything else, I'm gonna hand me a mic, I'll go all night. <laughs> um, I do wanna, oh, Nacham is gonna share, sorry. Okay, go ahead. No. <laughs> um, I'll just share a story that just happened with my parents actually, but my mother shared it with me after I shared with her something that um, I guess was on my mind and I reached out to Mashpia about it. Um, I wasn't able to, to connect with her right away. It took like three weeks. And of course in the process, what do you think happened? I got a lot of clarity and I understood what I needed to do. Um, and I felt like it was like this, this gift of just like asking or just having that, that person, I guess, gave me a lot of insight into like what I needed to hear. And then she shared this story that just happened um, where someone experienced something similar where basically my parents have a Chabad house near a hospital and they have all different kinds of Yidin that come for treatment. Um, and this specific family was an older, an elderly couple and basically they had a new grandson. So this, these parents, it was I think their 11th child, Kleinhara, came with their whole family down to Houston to have the bris with these grandparents in Houston. And because of that, the the parents of the mother, so basically like the other, the Mechatanim came as well to Houston for this bris. Um, and as they're leaving, um, you know, my father gives them shleich mitzvah to send them on their way and he says, oh, you're a Lubavitcher, I want to tell you a story. This is, 
they're, they're wonderful people. They're a very Litvisha family. I think he teaches in Tar Vidas. And it was, he's not, uh, by any stretch, consider himself a Lubavitcher. He said, I had a story that, um, that recently happened. So, I mean, not that recently happened. I have a story that happened to me. You're a Lubavitcher. I want to share with you. So basically, when he was, I guess, a Bachar, he's, he's an elder, elderly, whatever. He's, he was a Zayda to this, young, to this young baby. And he says he had a big question in Kirov. That was what he said. Something that was very personal and intimate in nature. And he had to get a lot of clarity about it. So he decided, who should he go to if not for the in his last line, like the Gadol of Kirov, the person who really understands this. So he went to the Rebbe, and when he gets there, he is told that you can't just walk in. Um, you actually have to wait for like two or three hours right now. Um, but if you want, he was able to have a Yechadis, but he had to wait and he had to write what he needed to, what he wanted to ask the Rebbe down on paper. So my mother shared this with me because basically at this point, he, he stands pacing back and forth. He wasn't expecting it. And during that time that he's pacing back and forth, he actually gets clarity to his question, um, and he 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 knew he he knew what he needed to do. He decided to still go inside, of course, and to get the bracha from the rebbe. So he goes inside after you know he had his time, and he got the rebbe's bracha, and the rebbe was I guess he he was on he was on the right track. Um, and when he ended his yichidus, the rebbe told him, forget the exact lashin. I should look it up, but basically something that was he did understand what the connection of it was to the issue at hand that essentially the Mashiach is going to come through through basically through chesed and through gemilz chesedim that's not the exact words but that, that was the idea the gist of it he had no idea what it had to do with anything um, and he's telling my father this is what happened this, I, I don't understand what this means to my parents I guess at that moment it was something that they felt like was a direct what they needed to hear in their shluchas, their my mother calls herself a con, uh, you know a concierge for everyone that comes physically, spiritually, but for them it was a good reminder that you know we're all doing our our own our own different kinds of shluchas in all of our different lives, and I think that you know some it's it's nice to be able to get those messages, but there's no doubt that the Rebbe is, um, you know. The fact that the Rebbe could say something, however many years, and, and it's exactly what they needed to hear, there's no doubt that the Rebbe is with us, and the Rebbe is watching us and giving us the chizok that we need to, to continue what we're doing. Yeah, may bekar mamish. Hey, ladies, we hope that there are some one or two ideas that resonated. We are by no means experts in this field. We're 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 chassidim that are on a journey, struggling in our own way with these big ideas on a very very enormous enormous intense um, day and time, and I I guess we will end with l'chaim. I, I need l'chaim. May we really really um, leave galus. We're ready. Listen. Let's, let's see
Do you have a stand? Yeah. Okay, that'll be good. Stand will be good. Yeah. Okay. Is there is there a PA system in the tent or there is? There are speakers here? Yeah. I don't have to project my voice. Do you hear me in the back row? The mic's not on. Okay. Now the mic's on? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, this is okay, this level? You hear me? Huh? Oh, <laughs> you got to say things clearly. Um, we're, I'm being encouraged to encourage those who are standing over in that corner to fill up the chairs that are empty in this corner. It's, it's, it's an interesting shidduch because on this side of the room there's a bunch of people standing. On this side of the room there's a bunch of empty chairs. So maybe we could put those two together and then the chairs will have people and the people will have chairs. Okay. This is a an amazing setup over here. I heard about that. I had a sneak preview. Of the first of all, we want to thank the uh, Detroit Yeshiva for giving us their tent. Because the boys aren't here yet, so they're letting us use their tent for the event. I heard about this from uh, from my son Yisrael, who uh, I don't know. I didn't see him all day because he said he was setting up the tent. So I don't know. <laughs> He's the one who set it up. But okay. Um, So we've been learning more of the Rebbe's Igris. This is a continuation of a series that we began 30 days before Yud Aleph Nissen. Before the Rebbe's birthday, we started learning 30 letters in 30 days. And Baruch Hashem, many people got excited about learning the Rebbe's letters. And then after Yud Aleph Nissen, people said, you can't stop. You've got to continue in some capacity. So we... We, we launched part two of the series, which was a Gimel Tamas Hachona. We've been preparing for Gimel Tamas over the past 30 days. We started on Gimel Sivan, 30 days before Gimel Tamas. And uh, we didn't do it every day because that was a little bit, at least for me, <laughs> a little bit excessive. Uh, we've been doing it every, every uh, Thursday night, a live letter. So this is letter number five. And we've been following a theme. All of our previous letters for the past 30 days have been about his kashas, have been about the connection, the relationship between a Rebbe and a Chassid and a Chassid and a Rebbe. Somebody wrote to me, by the way, and he's probably watching right now because from the things he wrote, it was apparent that he actually listens to <laughs> what I say. Um, I told a story. We, the first letter that we did in this series was the Shlomo Chaim Kesselman letter. And I mentioned a story about uh, Shlomo Chaim that he once was fabrenging and a Litva Shabacha said, I'll be a Makusha, but I don't need to be a Makusha to, to, to the Rebbe. I, I want to be Makusha to a Bayevarava, to the Amaroyim from the Gemara. And Shlomo Chaim said, well, it's nice you want to be Makusha to them, but who says they want to be Makusha to you? And the difference is the, the, the Rebbe is the Nasi, he wants to be Makusha to every Yid. So I told that story when we learned the letter, and then for some reason I told it again last week, and somebody wrote in and said, I don't like that story. Okay, so first of all, what do we say? This is, that's the story. That's how, you know why you can't ask a, story on, uh, a question on a story? It's because that's the way it happened. If it was fiction, if I made it up, you could criticize me. But <laughs> that's, what, that's what he said. Um, but the criticism I really loved because he said, 
why would anybody think that a Bayeverova wouldn't be connected to every Jew? And the person who wrote the letter made it clear that he's not coming from a Lubavitcher background. In fact, he said, when Lubavitchers speak this way, it sounds very insecure. It's a turn off. I want to tell you my reaction when I read that comment. I was so delighted that this guy has been so thoroughly brainwashed <laughs> that it's clear to him that a Bayevarova would want to be connected to every single Jew. And that's beautiful. And I'm glad that your view of a true Godel has become so rebified. And uh, that's great. And I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I was talking to, and I can't give too many particulars here, I was talking to a young woman recently who comes from a Litvisha background, and she was saying she saw something from a Tzivas Hashem uh, campaign where they were telling the kids, make the Rebbe proud. And she said to me, it's, it's weird. Why are you telling these kids to make the Rebbe proud? You know, the, the, the Rebbe passed away 28 years ago. You're telling them, make the Rebbe proud. She said, and I'm not going to say the name that she said, because it's not important for the story, and it would only be a distraction. But she said, I believe so-and-so is the God of Lador. And he's alive. And he doesn't know me. And he doesn't want to know me. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think he's missing anything that he doesn't know me. And you're going and telling these kids that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who passed away before they were born, is keeping track of, of them. So I didn't really answer that, what she said to me. But I treasured it personally because it was a moment of clarity for myself. I said, wow, it never even occurred to me that there could be some, and this is a very intelligent, very spiritual, very thoughtful young woman. It never occurred to me that there could be a concept of someone who's considered the God of Lader, and that part of that definition is not that they know about, or at least want to know about, every single Jew. Like, to me, that's automatically, in fact, more than saying somebody is smart, oh, they know kola tera kula. Okay, but do they know every Jew? That, to me, is <laughs> the first quality. Then you could ask me, you know, how much of a, a Talmud Chochem are they? So the idea that a, that a Rebbe is truly connected and wants to be connected, I mentioned at a Fabrengen in the Five Towns, a few nights ago we had a Fabrengen, we had our Gimel Tamas, pre-Gimel Tamas Fabrengen in the Five Towns, where I am, I am uh, fortunate to be on Shlichus, just 15 minutes from here. Um, and I mentioned at the Fabrengen how the Rebbe is connected to the entire Jewish people. And I shared, I, di I didn't plan on sharing this, I just, I, I shared it very spontaneously. A, a recollection that I had of being at a Sheva Brachas of a cousin of mine who's not a Lubavitcher in Manhattan at the Karlbach Shul. And um, there was a, a gentleman there, an elderly gentleman at the time. This was, I was a Bachar in 770 at the time, so this is like 1998 or, or something like that, maybe 97. And they introduced me to him, and he said, oh, you're a Lubavitcher, and I was the only Lubavitcher there. And I said, yeah. So he said, I used to go on business trips to Jamaica in the 50s and the 60s, and whenever I would come back from Jamaica, I would go to the Rebbe, and it would always have Yechidus. They would always let me straight in because uh, I could report to the Rebbe about everything that's going on. For the, it's a very small Jewish community there, maybe like 100 families in Jamaica, and I would report to the Rebbe about the few Jewish families in Jamaica. So I asked this guy, I said, you're not a Lubavitcher, how come when you would come back from Jamaica, you would report to the Lubavitcher Rebbe? So he looked at me almost like stunned and he said, who else would care? Who else would care? It's a hundred Jews, hundred families living in some godforsaken island. Like, 
We got problems of our own over here. Who, who are you going to tell about? What leader has time for that? So I mentioned that story. I, I did not plan on telling that story, but I got a WhatsApp the following day from the Shliach in Jamaica. <laughs> And uh, he said that he was off to put on a mezuzah in a house of a Yid who's the only Jew who lives in his town. And he was driving through a forest and he was listening to the replay of the Fabregen. And all of a sudden, as he's driving in some totally desolate area of Jamaica, he hears this story about who cares what's going on with the Jews in Jamaica? The Lubavitcher Rebbe. So... Anyways, in answer to the gentleman who wrote to me, you're 100% right, and congratulations <laughs> that your, your worldview has been, been so thoroughly uh, influenced by the Rebbe's teachings that it is an, an absolute, obvious, apparent reality to you that all of the Tanoim Vamaroyim would want to know every single Jew, even an intermarried Jew living in a trailer park in Oklahoma, all the Tanoim Vamaroyim would want to know him and spend time with him and speak to him and smile at him, show him love. And I, I believe you're correct. So thank you for pointing that out. So today's letter is from the Igris. It's uh, another letter from Tafshin Yud. We, we did a number of letters from Tafshin Yud from the year of the Friedrich Rebbe's passing. So I'll just start here. Baruch Hashem Yud Zayin Elul. Do people have the, the PDF at least? Yeah. Where's the, what's the? In case people are watching on YouTube right now, the, uh, the PDF's not on YouTube. So where where can people get the PDF? Thirty Letters Thirty Days dot com. Yeah, 30letters30days.com, the PDF is there. Baruch Hashem Yud Zayin El Tavshin Yud Shalom Avracha. The 17th day of Elul, the year is 5710, Tavshin Yud, which is the year of the, the Friedrich Rebbe's Histalkus. The Rebbe says Shalom Avracha, which as we all know, those of us who've been studying the Igris, that's how the Rebbe greets a man. And this man is a father, and he's writing about his son, as you are about to see. B'mayin al mechtove mechai menachem of sheshel be'inyin ha'toke me'machanai ato ulon. First thing the Rebbe addresses, in response to your letter from the 18th of Av, when you're writing about moving, relocating, and where you should relocate to. This is not just talking about moving down the block. This is talking about somebody who's looking to leave the country that they're in. I don't know what country they were in. I mean, I could make some guesses. This is 1950. This is, um, at this point, the war refugees really don't have an, any place to go. They have to find permanent homes. There were DP camps, displaced person camps. In fact, remember the first letter we did in this series, the Shlomo Chaim letter, that Rebbe was speaking about the DP camps. Uh, so the, uh, by this point, the DP camps were shut down. Uh, a lot of a lot of Lubavitchers. This letter seems to be written to a, a Lubavitcher Chassid. Were in Paris, sort of as like a temporary place to be before they found some place else to go. So the Rebbe is writing them and says, "Hine <laughs> I'm, I would be interested to find out if you could get papers, meaning documents, to uh, travel to America, Canada, or Australia, America, Canada, Australia. Ulfi erech kamezman nitzrech alzed, and also how much time it would take. Vim ein avsharias biyade yediyani, and if it's not possible to get to any of those three places, then let me know. I want to find out. Okay. Umasha Kosov Shlevnoi, what you write about your son. Ein Cheshek Kolkach Belimude, 
that he's not so excited about learning, that your son is not so excited about learning Torah. So what should this father tell this son who's not so excited about learning? So maybe he should tell him how important it is to learn. Yeah? Let's see what the Rebbe tells him. Yas birlai, you should explain to him, ve'esius hamasimis lefanov, in words that are appropriate to him. As itzter is gorandrish, the Rebbe says in, in Yiddish, that now things are completely different. It's a very interesting expression. Things are completely different now. We're, we're living in a new era. We're living in unprecedented times. In what way? <sighs> Remember, this is Tav Shin Yod. This is right after the Histalkus of the Fidik Rebbe. So what times are we talking about? V'tzarech Das, he has to know. Asher kveid kedush is made v'chomi admur hakam, hu hu hanasi v'harosh shall kol chasidav mukshadav, that my father-in-law the Rebbe, he is the nasi, the leader, and he is the head of all of his chasidim and all those connected to him. V'keven shaharosh harei b'pshitos agmura hu bari v'chazak, since the head is obviously healthy and strong. It is obvious that he, the head, the Rebbe, is healthy and strong. That he, the Rebbe, has within him all of the power, potential, and vitality that belongs to each one of those who are connected to him. And he has it completely. He's the head, like an organism that has a head. All of the limbs may be different limbs, but they all receive, like so this explains, they receive their vitality from the head. And we know in this case, the head is healthy and strong. The head is the, is the Rebbe. And that the Rebbe, being the head, has all of the, the power and all of the life in its fullest, complete form that each one of his chassidim require. And the only thing that's a factor here, the only, the only uh, variable is up to them. In other words, whatever you need, he's saying to the father, explain to your son, whatever it is that you need, the Rebbe has it, because he has whatever all of his mukushadim need. And he has it completely intact. It's available. It's in stock. It's already there. And all you have to do is claim it. It's yours already. However, conversely, this is, for the Rebbe, very negative talk. The Rebbe avoids anything negative. But here the Rebbe says, and if not, and if one doesn't conduct oneself according to what the head would want them to do, this doesn't only affect the person himself. It's a two-way street. The Rebbe is stuck with you. So maybe you don't care about yourself, but at least have some sympathy for the Rebbe. Those are my words. I added that. There's a letter also in the Igris from Tafshin Yud Aleph from the following year. Over a year later, it's from uh, Cheshvan of, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, no, it wouldn't be over a year later. It would be two months later because this is Elul of Tafshin Yud. This is the last couple of weeks of Tafshin Yud. So uh, from a couple months later, there's a letter 
where the Rebbe is writing to a chassid, and uh, officially we don't know who it is. You ask me later, I don't know, I'll, maybe I'll hint to you who it is. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter. Anyways, there's a letter the Rebbe is writing to a chassid who wants to go to college. And the Rebbe tells him it's not really a proper thing for him to do. And uh, first of all, the Rebbe says <laughs> it's something very interesting. He says, you're sort of your claims that you want to do something, I told you not to, it's a whole correspondence back and forth. The Rebbe is saying, I told you not to do it, and you're saying you want to do it anyway, but I don't believe you because the Rambam says in Hilchus Gerishin that every Jew wants to do the right thing. <laughs> right? It's, you know the famous thing, the Kaif and I say, you hit the guy until he says, I agree. Isn't it coerced? No, it's not coerced because the Rambam says, deep down, every Jew wants to do the right thing. So he says, so don't tell me you don't want to do the right thing. I, I, I read the Rambam. The Rambam says every Jew wants to do the right thing. Um, and then the Rebbe says, look, you know, when, when, when it, we don't have this anymore, but there used to be something called Ari Miklot, cities of refuge for a, a uh, in, what do you call it, uh, manslaughter for an accidental uh, killer. So the din is that if a Talmud goes into Golis, Rabbi, his, his teacher, goes with him. So the Rebbe writes to this Chassid and says, you can't go wherever you want to go because wherever you go, you're going to schlep the Rebbe with you. He's going to be forced to come along. And then the Rebbe says, apparently in response to something that this young man had intimated to the Rebbe, that if so, then I voluntarily sever my connection so that I won't be torturing the Rebbe to bring the Rebbe with me. The Rebbe says, you can't do that. Why not? Because it's like a Gershon is Geyer, the Rebbe says. That once he dunks, he comes out of that mikvah, he's stuck, and even if he sins later, it doesn't matter. He's just a Jew who's sinning. <laughs> he can't become un-Jewish. So the Rebbe says, you connected yourself to the Rebbe, kamaim aponim alponim, the Rebbe reciprocated, you're locked in, that's it. And now, wherever you go, the Rebbe comes with, and then the Rebbe says, gefei lecha isius. From Igeres HaTshuva, third chelik of Tanya, the, the Alta Rebbe speaks about the effect that a Yid has on the Shechina when he, when he sins. Get us a tshuva, the altar explains that tshuva, the word tshuva, return, is tosh of hay, to return the hay, the hay of Hashem's name, which is malchus or shechina, and that when you sin, you're taking the, the hay of Hashem's name, yud ke vav ke, and you're schlepping that into klippa, and the way that it's described in chesidus is melech oseh the king who is held down in the gutter. So the Rebbe says, if you do this, if you go somewhere that the Rebbe doesn't want to go, you are taking the Rebbe under duress and, and forcing him into that place. So, here what is the Rebbe saying to this father? Explain to your son, first the positive. Everything he needs, he, the Rebbe has it, and it's available for him to just claim it. But conversely, you should let him know that if he doesn't claim his potential, if he doesn't live up to his abilities, then it's not just the loss of something positive, it's actually causing damage. It's not just, you're not just hurting yourself. Isn't that always the claim? Who am I hurting? What am I, a murderer? What am I, a thief? Who am I hurting but myself? Well, there's no such thing as you're only hurting yourself. That's Bechlal that I've explained how we're all interconnected, that I've explained the muscle of the, the space mission, that we're all on the, in, the, in the space capsule, on the rocket ship, and everything we do affects the integrity of the mission. But this is a, on an even deeper level, that you're connected to the Rebbe. So anything you do, it's not just affecting you, it's affecting the Rebbe.
The Rebbe continues. That if you'll meditate on this for even a moment, it is certain. You're going to see, you're going to perceive the incredible responsibility that has been given to you. And in a way that is commensurate with your health, I think that's such an interesting phrase there. In a way that's commensurate with your health, Yimsayr, you'll turn over, give over, v'yitenes atzmei, and dedicate yourself, the Rebbe says in Yiddish, zich ibra geben, gorin gansen, to completely give yourself over, l'retzene shel kveid kedushas meid v'chomi admor hakam, to the Rebbe, ulmilui dvorov, and to fulfilling his words, v'yireisov and his teachings, before I continue this, we're in the middle of a sentence, but I just think it's very interesting here. You can argue with me what that means. And maybe I'm totally misreading Pshat. But for those people who say that all the responsibilities that Ebbe gave us makes them uncomfortable because they feel like they're crushing under the obligations, I see right here that Ebba says, be realistic about your capacity. That Ebba says, yeah, give yourself over in Gansen completely, but in Gansen is a relative term, in a manner that's healthy, in a manner that makes sense. Obviously, no one's asking you to hurt yourself. You're not supposed to hurt yourself. You're supposed to preserve yourself and then give over that beautiful preserved self. I think that's really important. I think maybe those few words got lost somewhere along the line in the Masada. Because I think a lot of people, especially our youth, think that Zich Iber Geben and Gantz and Sumrebn should somehow be painful or involve some type of self denial. And uh, clearly, that's not what it's saying over here at all. To the contrary, that I was describing the manner in which one claims all the power and the vitality that is available to him. The koiches and the chayes. Koiches and chayes is good stuff. <laughs> so how do you get it? By turning your will over to the Rebbe. But it's not supposed to hurt and it's not supposed to damage you. God forbid. It's only going to be helpful in every way. Okay. So the Rebbe says, giving yourself over to the Rebbe's words and his directives. All right, words and directives. Which words and directives? So here the Rebbe says, Hanim tsoyim that are found in his sichas. Michtov of haklolim, in his general letters. Those are the letters the Rebbe wrote addressed to all Jewish sons and daughters everywhere. And also individual letters that, Reb, that, that the Rebbe wrote to individuals. The Rebbe doesn't say here, by the way, letters that the Rebbe wrote to you. Maybe, again, maybe I'm taking liberties here. <laughs> but it seems like the Rebbe is saying, where do you find the Rebbe's directives, well, the Sichas, that's the first thing the Rebbe mentions, that's, that's obvious, the Rebbe's talks, but also in the Rebbe's letters, and even in the individual letters, like what we're learning right here. This is a Michtov Prati, this is a letter that Rebbe wrote to an individual, and uh, has incredible guidance for us. And in these sikhas and mikhtovim, these talks and these letters, every individual will find, every individual of the Jewish people will find directives in how to live life. Which is really what we've been doing with learning the igris is letting the Rebbe teach us how to live life.
und man darf nicht ins Pol werden. And don't be, how do you even translate? Don't be in this poll. Don't be intimidated. It's, me, it's even more than that. It's like don't even pay it any mind. Not just don't be intimidated. Don't even worry about it. Don't give it a second thought. That's how you say it in English. Don't even give it a second thought. Was hat a kleiner Jingle for a scheiches mit der Zagreisen Reben? What connection could a little boy have with such a great rabbi? The Rebbe is coaching the father. He's telling the father how to talk to his son. His son lost his cheshik to learn. He's not excited about learning. It's interesting. The Rebbe doesn't say anything here about telling the son how important it is to learn. <laughs> Didn't even mention learning. He said, talk to your son in appropriate words about the connection he has to the Rebbe, that all of the powers that he needs, he can find it by the Rebbe. If he doesn't do it, it has an effect also on the Rebbe. And that if he'll think about this for even a moment, it'll have an effect on him. And he'll realize the great responsibility that he has. And if he'll say, <laughs> I'm just a little kid. Me? I have responsibilities. You're talking about such a great Rebbe? And he's relying on me? Little old me? Come on. What do I have to do with such a great rabbi? This concept is explained in many places. The rabbi says, I enclosed here a copy of the Mimer <laughs> from Chayel of this year. This is Yud Zayin Elul, this letter. So the, the letter from the, the Mimer from the from the next day. That we explained this in, uh, I think, the previous class, that there were my modem that were pre-written by the Friedrich Rebbe, and they came out even after Yud Shvat, after the Histalkos. So this is one of those my modem. And in that Mimer, the Rebbe says even where to look, in, uh, in Perek Zion of the Mimer. But over there, it's giving a marshal how to understand mitzvahs. If Hashem is infinite, like, how can we, how can we do his mitzvahs? Or why would it even matter if we do his mitzvahs? And uh, the Maimir gives a marshal there that there, there's a chocham gadol. There's this genius. And the genius is involved in matters that even other geniuses don't understand, let alone regular people. And, uh, you know, the Einstein is in, uh, in, his, uh, in his room at Princeton with the chalkboards, writing the, all the formulae, and then all of a sudden the janitor walks by. He has no idea what Einstein's writing on the chalkboard. Even the other professors can't uh, help cup. And all of a sudden Einstein tells the, the janitor, go bring me a cup of water. All of a sudden, I'm filling it in. I'm, I'm, I'm embellishing the marshal a little bit. But the Rebbe there, the, and the Mimer says, the Chochem Godel tells some regular guy, go do me a favor. All of a sudden, there's a connection. Even though this regular guy has no clue about the significance of what this genius is involved in. And he, he can't, he's not even able to understand what the genius is involved in. And a minute before, he was completely, not even a blip on the radar screen of this, of this genius. But now that the genius asked him, get me a cup of water. He doesn't say get me a cup of water, but whatever. I'm saying get me a cup of water. I'm not actually saying get me a cup of water. I have a cup of water, just in case you. Now all of a sudden, there's a connection between this simple little guy and this big genius. And so the Mimer says the same thing with mitzvahs, that even though Hashem is infinite, and we can't wrap our minds around that. But when the infinite one asks us, do something for me, now there's a connection and we become infinitely important because infinity has asked, has asked us to do its bidding. So 
the Rebbe is saying, explain to your son. I don't know how old the son was, but he, he, he referred to him as a little kid. Right? In Yiddish. I don't know what age that means, but I mean, I'm supposed, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming it means even before Bar Mitzvah, Kleiner Yingle. So this father is supposed to explain to his son that the Rebbe is great, yeah, maybe even so great that Tati doesn't understand how great the Rebbe is, and yet the Rebbe wants something from you. It, it's, it's interesting. There's a letter, a Mikhtov Klali, from Reish Chedish Shvat, Tav Shin Yud Aleph, 10 days before the first yard site. You know the, the Yud Shvat Min Hagim? You know the list of Yud Shvat Min Hagim? And that we use those now for Gimel Tammuz Min Hagim? Where is that from? There's a letter, Reish Chedish Shvat, Tav Shin Yud Aleph. So 10 days before the first yard site, the Rebbe wrote, a mikhtov klali, a general letter, and there he writes different minhagim to uh, different customs to keep for the observance of the yard site. There's many things are written there, like lighting the candle, and saying the mimer. But there's a section there about speaking to children. Well, before that, there's a section about going to shuls and speaking to adults and to chazer avort, to say something. Uh, to say, to give over a teaching of the Rebbe, speak about the Rebbe. But then there's a whole paragraph about speaking to children. And uh, it says over there, you should speak to children and you should tell them about the Rebbe's chiba yaseira, his, his extra love that he had for children. And uh, also, that he demands from them what he, he, he demands certain things from them and that he relies on them and hopes in them that they'll do it. So Asher Tova that he demands from them and the trust and the hope that he has in the children that they'll do what he demands. I think it's very interesting. He loves them he demands from them, and he trusts that they'll do it. I mean, right there, you could make a whole parenting course just on that one line. He loves them, he demands from them, and he trusts that they can do it. First and foremost, he loves them, because you know what? I don't want your demands <laughs> if you don't love me. So that you establish, he loves you. He demands from you, and he's sure that you can do it. It's more, that he's sh more than just he's sure. He's relying. He's relying on you that you're going to do this. How are we supposed to speak to our children about the Rebbe? So the Rebbe told us how to speak to children about the Rebbe. We tell them that the Rebbe loved children, the Rebbe loves you, the Rebbe expects certain things from you, and the Rebbe knows that you can do it. The Rebbe trusts you that you can do these things for him. That you can help him. You know, there was a, in the talks and tales, there was an announcement about the histalkus of the Fedeke Rebbe. The, the monthly that came out for children. So after Yud Shvat, there was an announcement written and uh, it's an, I mean, it's a fascinating uh, read because it's written for children and it's written in English and uh, it just condenses such deep concepts into such simple English for children. But over there it says similar things. It says, children, you should know that our dear rabbi loves the children and that just like he cared for them before, he's caring for us now, and that there are things that you can do for him that will bring him much pride. I mean, in case people are wondering, where did this come from? Is this a real thing? Or like I started off <laughs> at the beginning telling you about this, uh, this young woman who said, why are you telling children? Make the Rebbe proud of you. 
Okay, so in the talks and tells, in English, in talks and tells, that wasn't for chassidim. <laughs> this, this, that was 1950, writing to American Jews, reading, reading English, and, and, and it says, you should tell the kids, our, our, our beloved rabbi is still with us, and he's watching us, and he's getting tremendous pride from everything that you, the children, are doing. And that he's a soul, and because he's a soul, so he's still with us, and it doesn't ma- the body is not, does not prevent him from being present with us. These concepts, this is what you're supposed to tell kids. And that there's a relationship. Just because this person passed away doesn't change the fact that this is the soul of a person who cared for every Jew, and especially for the little children, and continues to care for the children. And that not only he cares for you, but it's a two-way street. You can take care of him. Yeah. Betach yesh loy vegam lechasone sh'yich ye kvies itim b'yichud l'teres kveit kedushas meida v'chom ye admor hakam v'emrim gam kein kapitol ayin aleph detilim. Now that Ebba switches to another topic, certainly you and your son-in-law have uh, set times to study chassidus, especially the teachings of the chassidus of my father-in-law, and that you're saying chapter 71 of Tehillim. That would be the Friedrich Rebbe's capital that year. This is also one of the sources for continuing to say the capital of a Rebbe after the Histalkus. Admur Hakam Mateva. As per your request, I will be mentioning you and your entire family. May they be well at the Isle of my father in law for a good sweet year. This is or to be written and sealed for a good year. This is remember we said Yud Zayin El two weeks before Rosh Hashanah. With the blessing for being written and sealed for good, for a good and sweet year. And that is the letter. I want to mention also there's a uh, a sicha from Shabbos Parshas Bay Tafshin Mem which was Ches Shvat, which if you're interested in further study about speaking to children about his kashris, that is your Kitzer Shulchan Aruch. The Rebbe is speaking about preparing for Yud Shvat, and the Rebbe says there that children need extra preparation. It's very interesting what the Rebbe said. First of all, Preparing on Shabbos, you're not supposed to prepare on Shabbos. But because it's Tzor Chitzibur, it's for a communal need, then you are allowed to prepare on Shabbos. And the Rebbe says that adults can prepare much more quickly, but children, because every concept needs to be explained to them. (laughs) Because when you're explaining a concept to a child, they don't have the context built in already. So the Rebbe actually there says something remarkable. He says, when you're telling them about preparing for the histalkus of the Rebbe and you have to talk to them about that, first you, even, you may even have to explain to them what histalkus means. So the Rebbe is talking about preparing children who, who need to be really taught everything, even, even the most basic concepts. And over there in that sicha, the Rebbe explains at length the concepts that you should teach the children. One, one thing I found remarkable, uh, the Rebbe says in that sicha, to tell children about thought, speech, and action, and that the world was created with the letter He. And like the Alter Rebbe says in Shah Yechud Ve'amona, every letter, its shape, the shape of the letters indicates the nature of that letter. And what does it mean the world was created with the letter He? It means that there's thought, speech, and then a little break and then action. 
Not everything you think and not everything you even speak about doing needs to be done. So there has to be the little break, the little half sick. But if you don't have any action, if you take it away, then the hay becomes a dalid, which is dalus, which is poverty. And the Rebbe says this is what the Fedek Rebbe talks about in the mimer of the Hilula, the hemshich of the Hilula. If you're familiar with the whole hemshich, Bosilagani is not one mimer, it's a whole hemshich of maimarim. So over there, the, the, the Fedek Rebbe speaks about this idea about the hay and the dalid different oisius, but when I saw that, I thought to myself, wow, I get why the Rebbe said that in connection with Yud Shvat, because of, it's mentioned in the Bosilagani Hemshech, but it hit me that it's even more connected to Gimel Tammuz, because Gimel Tammuz, this year and many years, is in the week of Kairach, <laughs> and what did the Rebbe speak about Kairach? The Kairach is three letters, Kuf, Resh, Ches. And each of those letters are a corruption of the letter He. And that the model of how to be is the He, to have all three, the thought, the speech, the little break, and then the action. And uh, so it's interesting that Rebbe is telling us how to prepare children for the Yem Hilula. And he says to talk to them about the letter He. <laughs> so if you need a vort that's about Gimel Tamas and this week's Parsha, and probably something that they heard somewhere also, it's a famous vort from the Parsha, this is what you have to explain to them. There's thought and there's speech and there's action, and that the main thing is action, and we need to make hachlotas. So when Gimel Tamas comes, it's a time to make resolutions about how to be better, and that when we do these things, we're helping the Rebbe, the Rebbe loves us, and the Rebbe trusts us, and when we're better, this helps the Rebbe. This is what we're supposed to tell children. But there's a lot more there in the, in the Fabreng, and I, again, I recommend you take a look, Ches Shvat, Shabbos, Parshas Bay, Tav Shin Mem. So, Amir Tzah Hashem, Mashiach should be here before Gimel Tamas, and you will have an opportunity to explain to your children all about his kashas in a way that has nothing to do with the Hilula. But uh, either way, one way or another, we have to tell our children about the Rebbe and that the Rebbe loves them and is relying on them. Okay.